Hi everyone, my name is Kristen Gilmer and I'm a global health scientist and doctor of public health. I'm excited today to talk to you a little bit about how health misinformation can spread disease. So let me hop into my slide set real quick. Okay, so here's a bit of our agenda and just some things we're gonna go through. Um, first, we're gonna start with kind of the history of major health pandemics and misinformation that kind of surrounds them. Then we'll go into a little bit of analysis about COVID-19 and how misinformation is really kind of circled through that time. Then we'll get further into health errors, why people might feel drawn to health misinformation, some of the sources of misinformation and their impacts, as well as finally a conclusion, why we really have some great pointers for you and why it's so important. So first, let's hop to our first slide. So when you think about fake information, misinformation, one of the first terms that comes to mind between me and my friends is fake news. And this isn't really a new sensation. It was first used in the 1800s by William Randolph Hearst Publications. And they were talking about what was happening with imaginary battles in World War I that ended up getting picked up by other papers and circulated in ways that they didn't think would actually happen, but were great for revenue. The reason this is important is that the New York Sun called the Associated Press a fake news factory. What we now know as fake news is something completely removed and we take groups like Reuters and Associated Press as very relatable, very reputable, different journalism groups. And so I think it's important to talk about this as the world was being ravaged by the Spanish influenza, they were perpetuating these different types of information to make some money and something we call pandemic profiteering and to be able to make it difficult for people to tell the difference between real reporting and what's fake. But two things come to mind about this uh, when it comes to the fake news circulated in the 1800s and th things that are circulated now. The first is that this was very intentional, the sharing of misinformation. And two, they were coming from powerful entities. The Hearst publication uh, family was massive and had a lot of money behind it. But now, however, it's a little bit different. And the groups and reasons why people share different types of misinformation online, especially on Facebook, we have an entirely different field to work with, entirely different things to talk about. Uh, when it comes to everything from the Black Plague uh, slash the Black Death all the way to COVID-19, people can make excess income through pandemic profiteering, like the Hearst Group, like companies selling alternative treatments that have yet to be proven but may be harmful, uh, like people who are selling uh, different types of clickbait articles. And it is selling. If people click through and they get ad revenue, it works. But we most often see these with different companies who tend to either raise prices of medications or PPE, different types of equipment to prevent you from getting ill. And we also see it with faulty equipment, uh, things that tend to be self-promoting or help someone become an expert. So there is a big difference between this type of pandemic profiteering, what I think a lot of people assume is sharing misinformation on social media, and the people who actually do it. A lot of this has to do with the mid-information and misinformation Nat has talked about in these earlier sessions, because oftentimes people don't deliberately share this misinformation to cause harm or to cause any issues for the people who are receiving it but their impacts are often really wide reaching and can be life altering, especially when it comes to the spread of diseases. And so this is most likely what you're gonna be seeing as you're fact checking in this incredible role that so many of us are envious about because you are on the digital front line of preventing the spread of COVID in one of the most important ways we've ever seen with social media. That's why we think your job is so important why we think fact-checking can help assess these producers and stop it at its root. So fewer people who are exposed to this type of information, the better. We're gonna to hop to the next slide, which talks about the use of health misinformation from a historical perspective. Now, when you think about the Black Death in the 1340s, 1350s, throughout most of Europe, you might see a fact like this, which is a, a purported cure where people take new pints of milk, cut cloves of garlic into very, very small pieces, put it in a milk and drink it, 
every morning once you break your fast, it can prevent you from getting sick. So if you had to fact check it this time, where would you really come from? And this is something that I think really addresses a very important aspect of what you do. The cultural, social, historical, and traditional medicinal approaches to infection prevention and disease treatment is rooted in a lot of religious views and a lot of heritage and traditions that have lasted for thousands of years. For instance, when it comes to this, uh, this prevention method for spreading the, the plague, people think about milk as this really time-honored tradition, and it is. If you consider that things were not safe to drink or water were safe to drink at this time, milk was life-giving. It is what mothers could feed their infants without having to worry about contamination. It sold for a lot of money because it was difficult to find cows in small city areas. Uh, it tended to be what created people into becoming evolved creatures. It could build strong muscles, it helps their immune function, it helps their cognitive development. So the idea of using this really traditional uh, recipe, basically taking milk and then taking garlic, which had been at the time thought to prevent infections of different kinds because of several properties and the chemical components of garlic, it doesn't seem so far off than what people are using today. Even now, we encourage mothers to breastfeed and encourage many people to get the nutrients that they can from things like nutritional shakes that are based off the principle of milk so that they can stop an infection and start the process of kicking their immune system, both their adaptive and innate immune systems into overdrive. So you consider it this way, I think it gives a really great idea of how we can use local context and things that are rooted in historical fact to talk about why people want to prevent disease and how. And as we jump to the next slide, I think these two historical examples give a lot of great information. The first one is from smallpox. Uh, at the time, smallpox's mortality rate was around 30 to 40%. So imagine that, you're exposed, you're infected, and you had between three and four chances out of 10 of dying. That is a really, really scary percentage. But despite that and the extreme contagiousness of this disease, uh, what we now kind of refer to as anti-vaccinationists or anti-vaxxers, although we don't like to use that term in public health and don't feel like it's very appropriate, they believe that smallpox was only a minor threat. Uh, historically, people thought that the threat itself was minimal and that the vaccine itself is what caused you to become ill or die. This is despite people dying at such rapid rates before then. We started to kind of see how variolation and these very early attempts at vaccination helped save lives, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't still attempts at stopping this, this uh, share of misinformation by public health agencies. Some of these other uh, thoughts that come from it were that it was a big conspiracy and it led to uh, people concerned about pandemic profiteering from groups that made the vaccines, uh, especially from governments where people thought they were trying to get information or implant something within their population to make them perhaps react a certain way, follow laws and rules much, much more aggressively. Things that there wasn't really any basis in science for, but now we can understand that. It's also led to the rise of alternative authorities something that we see as people who purport themselves to be experts, but aren't. I would also advise you against considering anyone a true expert in COVID-19, simply due to the nature of the fact that this, this disease is brand new. This is a virus that we've known about for almost a year. It's not very long when it comes to the history of disease progression and epidemiology. But because of things like smallpox and people who were trying to pose conspiracy theories and other ideas about how they thought the virus worked and what vaccination really did, we can now see why in modern times, people like uh, often yoga teachers or holistic treatment centers or people who sell supplements that are claiming to stop or prevent infections, we can see why they've been able to take this type of leadership role at a time when people are clamoring for any type of information that is true. We also see that a lot with 
people who are against vaccines now and what we at Medan believe is going to be the next field of COVID-19 misinformation, the vaccine itself. This will root itself in the history of vaccines, but because there are so many candidates, we're expecting to see a lot of misinformation and misinformation spread and potentially prevent people from receiving the injections and the booster shots. So it's important to us to really, really stop this type of misinformation in, in its budding, its earliest iteration. Part of something we think should be said here is that in parts of Seattle, Washington, parts of Beverly Hills, California, they have lower rates of vaccination than in South Sudan and Rwanda post-conflict because people are so much more eager to receive an immunity booster, this type of protection from preventable diseases than people in the United States, despite the fact that there isn't a lot of science behind it. That is something that should not be happening. And a lot of that is rooted in misinformation. When it comes to COVID-19, that can lead to millions of lives and millions of deaths or millions of people who are now partially immune to a disease that can be largely prevented. One of the best case studies you can talk about when it comes to any type of infectious disease and misinformation is HIV. I'm sure you can think about it from any local context that you're in from almost any country. Uh, for instance, there was rumors about the four H's, people who, who had HIV, um, and in the U.S. that included the thought that it was just gay men or hemophiliacs, or the idea that this was rooted in immigrants from Haiti. And it comes to a lot of human rights violations and a lot of issues related to this. In South Africa, it's HIV is spread primarily through uh, sexual intercourse. Um, oftentimes this can also have to deal with vertical transmission from mother to child. Uh, in the US, again, it was thought to spread mainly through uh, men who have sex with men, what we call MSM. Um, when it comes to Ukraine, we see gender-based violence, teenage pregnancy and injection drug use as some of the higher percentage causes here. Clearly, this is not a one-size-fits-all model, but between uh, really the early iterations in the 20s of what we think is the root of HIV and where it started, through today, we still see these same talking points, that it's a white man's disease, uh, that it's a punishment, a religious thing, uh, but that's certainly not true. There is one root cause, this is HIV, and it can impact any population, any group. But because people are able to spread misinformation so quickly and in such varied ways, it leads to disease, it leads to stigmatized populations, a lack of healthcare access or awareness for people who need it the most, and the sustained spread of a highly preventable disease. This is why I like to use HIV in this model because it's throughout the world in very rich and very poor populations, in low resource and high resource settings, and impacts people from any number of walks of life. When it comes to COVID-19, I think one of the biggest things that we see is the response and the perpetuation of misinformation from global thought leaders. By that, I mean people who are not only running countries, they might be running companies, might be running ministries of health, which is a really scary thing to think about, but it's varied greatly by region and leader. I'm sure you've probably become aware that a recent study suggested the biggest spreader of health misinformation related to COVID-19 was President Donald Trump, and that is largely using his social media presence as well as his traditional media pre presence in things like press conferences or interviews. His initial spread of the idea that hydroxychloroquine could be used as prevention or treatment for COVID-19 caused increased usage among people who were not prescribed the drug, a drug shortage among people who had autoimmune diseases and were reliant on it, like people who have systemic lupus, or people with rheumatoid arthritis, and saw an increase in hospitalizations for people who either overdosed on it or had an allergic reaction because they shouldn't have taken the drug in the first place. What this means is not only are these people not safe from COVID-19, it also means that they're taking up precious hospital space of people who do have this virus who should be quarantined in a very pristine hygienic setting. We do see some really strong responses in places like New Zealand, uh, places like Rwanda, where they have a markedly different response uh, that has sometimes caused some disagreements among scientists, 
but have led to largely safe and healthy populations. We do see still some rumors circulating about the origins of the virus. Did it come from, uh, we know it's zoonotic, but did it come from a horseshoe bat? Did it come from different types of uh, insects or avians? Or I've even seen studies about bears. We don't know yet. It's, it's likely a bat, but people are now saying there's a link between that and the nation of China, which is a little ridiculous considering animals, especially bats, can fly anywhere. They don't respect invisible borders. So it's, it's a virus that really originated with animals. This itself has led to more misinformation, especially about labs in Wuhan. The Wuhan Institute of Virology is a really widely respected uh, public health entity within China. But because of social media, these ideas really perpetuated and it impacted other populations. It kind of started a rumor mill about how conspiracies spread and, excuse me, were spread and how different ideas about where the disease came from made people think it was a biomedical threat. It was something people were targeting us with. It makes your job as fact checkers really difficult, but it's also why your job is so important. You can nip all of these ideas in their earliest iteration because you're in a position that so many health experts and scientists, journalists, physicians, we all envy because you have the ability to save people's lives right from the start. Day one, you stopping something will stop another person from sharing it or believing it. And it's that individual behavior change that's really going to stop the spread of this virus. Masks and vaccines aren't enough. Information is now a, a way to spread disease. As we go into a, a short analysis about this, we see a lot of the errors groups like the WHO and the United States CDC made. Everything from trying uh, medications that were initially shown not to be super helpful to denying the use of masks, uh, even to local and state governments not shutting down or taking precautions about increasing hygiene policies and requirements for different workplaces. These all cause the spread of disease, and there are different levels, certainly, but certain errors were made by large bodies that have reduced the amount of trust people place in them. And when you think about this, the draw of this misinformation, I think it's, again, important to think about the cultural, social, religious, and historical roots of a lot of it. During this pandemic, I myself have felt some anxiety, some isolation. If you were able to really grip into something and believe it and feel like you are one of the few who know this, it gives you a sense of control and social inclusion. When you think about ways to control anxiety, one of the best things people can do is be proactive and take approaches you think can help you. This is also part of misinformation. If you hear something helps or does not help, you would acknowledge that and practice it in your daily behavior, you feel much better. There's also a sense of exclusivity that I think everyone craves in some capacity or another, it's almost like the popularity of COVID-19. And generationally, we can also see that older populations tend to believe this much more so than younger ones. Now, when it comes to uh, fact checkers, you are the ones who can break the cycle and try to restore trust in a place where there is very little anymore. We'll hop to the next slide, and this is just a little bit more about misinformation and where it came from. One of the worst things to happen, uh, at least in, in public health, was the idea of the US Surgeon General saying, please don't buy masks, they are not effective. We now know that's not true. They benefit both the wearer and the people around them. But at the time, we were trying to save N95s, the highest grade masks for hospital facilities and, and first line caregivers. However, this message really, really took traction and made it so a lot of people did not agree with mask mandates or wearing them in general. It was only in November of 2020 that the United States CDC said that masks offer benefit two ways, both again, for the wearer and the people around them. So they don't inhale respiratory droplets or aerosolized particles that have some of the virus within them. So we do see trusted figures as big sources of misinformation, but social media, digital media spreads not only word of mouth misinformation, but direct knowledge and exposure to advertising kind of enhances this even further. When you add in group identity politics at a time when a lot of the world feels very polarizing and very politicized, it gets worse. So some of these impacts are, are things I think that are really unique to certain countries. It's actually a lot of the questions we get at Medium. 
So when it comes to India, one of the earliest rumors we heard was that warm water and kada could help prevent the spread of disease, uh, specific, specifically the spread of COVID-19. Kada is really just uh, boiled herbs and different spices with, with water. It's kind of similar to tea. Uh, but when we think about that as a potential way to prevent the spread of COVID, it's also a way that people, and I'm sorry, use, use traditional Chinese medicine in different iterations of that now. Tea can help your immune system. It can help support you in different ways and make sense that people would believe this about Kada. Uh, another unfortunate era of misinformation in India was the rise of Islamophobia for people who weren't practicing the same types of traditions that might be rooted in Ayurveda culture, for instance. In China, there was a lot of misinformation about this being a bioengineered virus uh, calling it the Wuhan flu or things like that from uh, national and global leaders led to an increase of hate crimes uh, among Asians throughout the world or people who were perce perceived to be of Asian descent, as well as victim blaming, victim blaming and shaming. It's a really difficult thing to see, but it still happens now. In Nigeria, one of the largest rumors we heard was that the virus can't survive in a tropical climate like where most parts of Nigeria are located. This led to unsafe consumption of water, an increase in consumption of water, uh, which caused a lot of diarrheal diseases and a rising number of cases of COVID-19 because people thought they were undergoing these protective behaviors they saw on WhatsApp, Twitter, and Facebook that actually were hurting them instead. The, the logic is there. Originally, we heard people who were in the southern half of the world weren't receiving huge cases like we did in the upper half, the northern region. Uh, but because of this hemispheric difference, it helps perpetuate these kinds of ideas. So again, some of them are rooted in science and tradition that holds up, but they're the, the small minutia that creates this misinformation causes big issues. And some of the myths that the Allergy and Asthma Network has had to be debunk include things like mosquito bites, neti pots, uh, and even the, the one we hear often, it's just like getting the flu. But in so many ways, it's so different. And so some of my most crucial tips that I would really like to give are underpinning source material. To me, this is the most important thing. It's, it's important to do it early, uh, which I, I talk about in uh, tip two. So having these really, really respected bodies are important. The World Health Organization, uh, the NHS, the United States CDC, but they've been wrong. How do you kind of restore trust in those organizations? By doing what academic journals have done. Several groups like the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet have had to strengthen their protocols because they printed studies they later had to retract. The data was flawed. Uh, they didn't have peer review. They published it much more quickly than they normally would. Because they've changed the process and made these studies much more rigorous, a randomized control trial in a journal like The Lancet, as opposed to a preprint that is shared because someone is really excited, tends to be much more accurate. It's also had other scientists in the peer review process un unpack it, see where there's errors, see where potential issues are occurring, and if the recommendations and findings are actually valid. So we really, really recommend those. If you have any difficulty understanding or translating this really heavy scientific language, please reach out to us. It's why we're here. We're happy to help you with any questions or answers we can provide. All you have to do is email us at health at medan.com or speak to your leads at Facebook and they'll help out. Another thing is newspapers. Sometimes we get really great quotes and really great ways of understanding the way a disease is spread through these types of quotes. There might be some heavy text or some difficult to understand verbiage that an expert has broken down into a, a really reasonable metaphor everyone can understand. So we recommend there as well. When it comes to academic and university sites, this is where the schools of medicine, public health, research, innovation, and technology really have their experts on the forefront. Questions they receive might be similar to the content you see, where they respond with facts, have their own studies listed, and talk about their work. And lastly, on this page, considering logic versus emotion. There's a graphic on the right from EpiWin and World Health Organization that tells you to consider emotion instead, excuse me, instead of sense of it, narrative instead of information. If things are spreading quickly and you go to someone's page and see how far back 
that goes, uh, sharing information from a particular source or group. It's a really good indicator that something is wrong, someone is buying into this, and they might have more than one uh, piece of misinformation they're sharing or that it's inaccurate. Uh, we're also looking at the seekers. These are the people we think will really, really impact, the observational viewers. So a person who shares 15 pieces of content about COVID being a hoax every day, it's gonna be hard to get through to them and they're gonna disagree with you. You're not gonna be having these conversations, but every time you flag something, they may feel it's part of a greater conspiracy, which makes sense when it comes to human nature and the psychology of disease. But the people who are looking for information, who have these questions, who are reading these pieces from people who are both heavily rooted in science and people who may not be, those are the ones who are really gonna impact the spread of disease. Because those actions, those secondary actions through behavior change, vaccine uptake, and using really solid prevention protocols are gonna be the difference between that person and their family getting sick and not. And lastly, consider mid-information versus misinformation. Is something partially true? This is difficult to decide, but again, we can help you. And if something is not entirely true, we recommend alerting people to that. And the last tips we have are being mindful, again, of people who shared it, checking the verbiage and their narrative tones. When it comes to certain words like cure, plan, secret, or including very broad groups, saying all of participants or every study participant, those are things we don't do often in public health, especially in epidemiology and infectious diseases. So those are great clues to know that someone might be sharing something inaccurate. And lastly, focusing on equity, racial justice, social conditioning, tradition, heritage, and any preconceived notion you might be going into this with. It's really, really difficult to source your own thoughts and keep them separate from what you read or learn. We all have these these cognitive biases that prevent us from being able to really accept something without judgment. And I think that's important to know. It all comes from a place of wanting to belong, wanting to stay safe, wanting to protect, wanting to feel less anxious. Very few people who are sharing this information on social media are profiting from it. It's important to know. So that's a big misnomer and it's something that we have to establish early. I think it's important to respect where people came from, where those ideas stemmed from, and understanding that your work might be difficult and you might feel like you're having a minimal impact, but on a greater level, it's much more important. And in this way, we have to remember that even though you might not be having these conversations, our work has to be based in fact, but also be self-aware. Again, circulated content is not something any group is immune to. We're still learning about these belief systems, but we do have to recognize that we are all uh, impartial judges when it comes to all of this. And remember, uh, disputing inaccurate information doesn't always change minds. It doesn't uh, mean that people will agree, but it doesn't really change the facts. I'm gonna screw up this quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, but it's something, something along the lines of, uh, science, science is, uh, I'm screwing this up, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter uh, if you believe it or not, uh, science is true. And so this is something I think you really have to remember when it comes to your work here. And I apologize for really messing that up. But we wanna reiterate how important your work is on this digital front line. When it comes to the sources of misinformation, social media is rampant. Facebook has so many users and such global power. You've been chosen because you're excellent at what you do. And we think that you have the power to really stop and curtail the spread of a brand new virus that frankly is dominating world topics and will for the next few years. It's gonna change a lot of things, but you have the power to influence and really change the course. So we wanna thank you so much for taking this time. Our team is so grateful to you. We're here to support you and do anything you need, but thanks so much. Again, I'm Kristen. I appreciate you taking time to listen to me and think about the world of health misinformation. <laughs>